Welcome Bethlehem Church Online. Whether you've been with us for a while or it's your first time here, just know this, we are so thankful you're here and we consider you part of our church already, our family, and uh, we wanna get to know you, we wanna connect with you. So first things first, we wanna know where you're watching from. We do this every week, but we love it. Like it's a fun thing for us to see, oh, somebody was watching from Brazil or somebody was watching from China or somebody was watching from the county over next to us. I don't know, wherever you are, home, coffee shop, vacation, whatever, we want to know where, you, uh, where you're watching from. And so uh, another way uh, for you to connect with us is go over, like download our Bethlehem Church app or go to our website, which really pushes all our information to that Bethlehem Church app. Um, look around there. There's a lot of things on there you probably didn't know that would be incredibly useful to you. Uh, but there's also a button that just helps you connect. It says get connected or connect and you push that button. Uh, and let me say this, you need to do that. I, I wouldn't even like say, maybe if you want to, you need to do that. Like in this world, in these days, you need to connect. And specifically, while you are here with us, you need to connect with us, all right? We want to know that you were here. Nothing would leave us sleepless tonight, like knowing you came and left and we never knew it, all right? So please do that. Um, you might have questions. You might be concerned about something. You may need something, a next step in your faith journey, and you don't know what that is. The best thing for you to do is to ask us. We are here to help you and we want to do that. So uh, please do that and let us know uh, what it is you might need and that you can. All right, so please do that today. Actually, go do it right now if you can. All right, uh, today's going to be awesome. I'm so glad you're here because a much needed series and uh, in content and uh, journey is what we're going to take uh, in the next few weeks as we jump into this new series called Foundations. And really, I know that more than anything in the Christian faith these days, I hear questions all the time and people, because people have a lot of questions. They have questions about scripture. They have questions about prayer. They have questions about like uh, just faith in general. And we're gonna go on a journey and answer some of those questions for you. Specifically today, you may go like, why do I need to read the Bible? Why is it important in my life? What, what need is it, uh, do I have for this, these words in, in, in this in this book, and I think a lot of that those questions are going to be answered for you today, and not only answered, but I think uh, walking out of today just completely inspired and fueled and ready to take on uh, what your faith journey is going to look like in the future. So uh, go on that journey with us. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I really am. All right, I really am. Tune in, worship with us. We love you.
Good morning, good morning. You can be seated. I'm so glad that you are here today. How is the 930 crowd doing? You guys doing good? Awesome. Well, my name is Matt Pyle, and I serve as one of the pastors here, and is grateful. I'm grateful to be here uh, with you today, uh, worshiping with you. Uh, in fact, today's May. Can you believe that? So May is here, which means uh, this could be a little bittersweet, but school is ending in the next few weeks. So moms uh, already preparing for that. Dad's preparing for that. Some of you are excited. Some of you are like, you're excited now, but then about June or July, you, you won't be excited anymore. So you'll be ready for school to start back. But this is a big week for our schools because it's Teacher Appreciation Week. And listen, we just want to join in in appreciating the faculty and staff of our local school system. So if you serve uh, in some sort of capacity, our faculty and staff, teachers, educators in our local school systems, would you stand up, just allow us to appreciate you and thank you for all the hard work this year. You guys are awesome. We appreciate you so much. We pray for you often. And listen, the thing that I appreciate the most and I mean this all my heart, is that, that my kids aren't going to have to live with me the rest of uh, their lives. So uh, they're actually going to be educated and get jobs, and they're going to move out. So uh, I just want to thank you personally for that. But hey, listen, if you are a first-time guest, welcome again. Uh, I want to let you know something that we uh, just started uh, this week. We have our First time connect uh, places out in our north lobby and our south lobby, and it's a great opportunity to connect whether you need to take a first step or a next step. And so when you leave out of here, if you're like, what is my next step here at Bethlehem Church? Stop by one of our connect centers, and there are some friendly faces there, and they will answer any questions uh, that you may have. Now listen, we're about to jump back into worship. Would you stand to your feet? Part of our worship expression is the giving and receiving of our offerings. We make this a part of our, our worship because it is giving back what Jesus has first given to us. And so there are many ways to give. You see those on the screens, but some ask, uh, you know, I still like to put an envelope into a box. Can I do that? You can do that. We do have boxes. As you leave out of here, you can drop uh, an envelope or this thing they call a check uh, in there too. You can, do, you can do that. Some of you still use those. But we just want to let you know that because of your obedience, because of your generosity, we're seeing God move, not in this community, just in this community, but all over the world. And so we want to thank you so much uh, for your faithfulness in giving. Now we're going to worship together. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you are faithful even when we are not faithful. And so God, this is an expression of our heart and soul saying thank you for who you are, your steadfastness, your faithful love endures forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Christ is my firm foundation Oh, the rock on which I stand Everything around me is shaking He's never let me down. He's faithful through generation. So I would he fell down. He won't. Yeah. He won't. I'll sing that again, Christ. Christ is my firm foundation. Come on, let's sing it.
church I grew up in we have some we had something called unmentioned assigned seating y'all know what I'm talking about if you grew up in the church everybody always sits in the same spot y'all do the same thing every time I walk through <laughs> I know where everybody is and I know if you missed because you're not in your spot and one of the things with our family my mom's right here on the front we, we had uh, our spot that we always sat together as a family two rows up to the right was this family and there was a lady that would lift her hands during the hymns. And I used to sit there and think, what in the world is wrong with her? And I remember asking a lot of questions, asking my mom, asking my dad, why does she stick her hands up in the air while we're singing? And the only conclusion I could come up with was that she's crazy. And then I got to college, college, and I get to a, a, a scripture in Psalm 63. 
and said, I will lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. And I remember reading that verse, shutting my Bible, and I went, she's not crazy. Like a total mind shift. Yeah. Now, this is not one of those things where we're going to police and see if everybody's lifting their hands, none of that stuff. But I just want you to know, sometimes those kind of things have just been placed in categories of charismatic or personality instead of just flat out just being obedient to the Lord. And sometimes you get to those places, and for me, most everything is like, Lord, I surrender, or Lord, I receive what you're doing, or I just need you to pick me up. Like your kid walks up to you and just wants you to pick them up. And so when we sing those words, and this is not a charismatic thing, out of all the things God could have told us to do, why would one of them be to stick your hands in the air? Part of it is because you got to really not care about what anybody around you thinks. You don't see somebody at the gas station like this, unless somebody's holding it up or something. But for the most part, you don't see that. And so that is the process to me. I throw up my hands. And I praise you again and again. No matter what, Lord, I will worship you. That is our choice. I want you to sing it with me again. This is our act of worship and obedience to the Lord. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. Ha One more time, I throw up my hands. You got it. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. So, Father, this is our prayer today, that we will be obedient to you. We will be doers of your word and not just hearers alone. Lord, we surrender to you. I thank you, Lord. Most of the time, I thank you that you never stop asking me for everything. You're constantly coming after me. You are relentless pursuing me and taking away the things that get in the way of why Jesus died on that cross in the first place. So Lord, today, no matter how we got here, no matter how frustrating our life is right now, no matter how frustrating the morning was, we fix our eyes on you. We surrender to you. We make room for you, Lord, to move and to be glorified in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray.
on the table. We go ahead and sign a blank piece of paper. You do whatever you want to do. When we do it, we mess it up. So, Father, we give it all to you today, this moment, to hear from you and your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. It is so, so good to be with you across all of our campuses at Bethlehem Church, Oconee 211. Uh, here with me at 316 if you're in the South Venue. We're glad you're here. Thanks for worshiping with us. Happy May, May 1. We're hopping into a series. God's got something for you today. I'm sure of it. Uh, in fact, the person you came with or the person you don't know, but they're sitting around you, look at them and go, hey, man, God's got something for you today. Do that right quick. Like you mean it. We're going to walk through a series over the next five weeks called Foundations, February of 2020. After six months or so of work, our discipleship team put together a book called Foundations, which is really the agreed upon foundations of the faith, no matter what your background is, the practices, the truths. Uh, we put it together in February 2020, and we launched off doing small groups through them. And then, if you remember March 2020, er, the world kind of stopped. Uh, and I always wanted to come back to it because a lot of it was put together uh, by our team, and, and it really was helpful. Never got the chance to, and looking through the preaching calendar, I knew this is where I wanted to go with it. But the idea is there are just foundational things that are true foundational practices that transcend time, space, scope, generation, and are a part of everybody's life. In fact, here's the way I'd say it. I'm talking to thousands of different people this morning across all of our campuses. That represents hundreds of different families. And those hundreds of different families live in hundreds of different homes. So everybody in this room has a place they would refer to as my house. Now, whether you rent it, you own it, or the bank owns it, and you think you own it, whatever it is, <laughs> right? You got something called my house. We're going to go to my house. We're eating dinner at my house, right? Everybody's heading over to my house, right? And all of our houses are different, different size rooms, different number of rooms, different years old, different floor features. Some of you got hardwood. Some of you got carpet. Some of you old school got shag carpet. You know what I mean? Some of you got bricks. Some of you got hardy plank siding. Some of you got wood, log cabin. I don't know. Everybody's got different different roof, different pitches on the roof, right? You got two-car garage. You got three-car garage. You got detached garage. Uh, I don't know. Everybody, but we have a place we call a house in all of our different square footage, all of our different number of rooms, all of our different houses, but there is one thing that we share in common. Every one of those houses, the structure that is your house is built on something called a foundation. Now that foundation may be a basement. That foundation may be a concrete slab. That foundation may be a crawl space, but there is a foundation. So listen to me. Everything you see is built on something you don't see. I'm going to say it again. Make sure you're getting the metaphor. Everything that you see is built on something you don't see. As people, we live different life. Church, as Christ followers, we experience different things. But I want to press in for a few weeks on the practices, the truths, what is the foundation in every believer's life that are not unique to the person or your wiring your personality, the way you're built. It's not unique, it's universal. We all experience this. These are all foundations in our life. See, in our time, 
we like the idea of common is it's common to everybody. And in our time, we like talking about our individuality. I mean, we're just seeped in it. Breathe it in, like, like your personal pressures, your personality type, right? Your wiring, how different your family is, and your pressure is, and right now your experience is. And so we get so caught up in, well, this is what works for me, and this is how our life is, and this is how our kids are, and this is how our unique things are. And and we get so caught up in that, we miss that as believers, there are just things that bind us that are foundations that are not different about us, but they're the same about us because the name that we bear is Christ. Are you with me? So what do you mean? Why is that? Again, in a world that we focus on our differences, we focus on our unique pressures, We focus on our family wiring and our heritage and what's unique to us and how we're so different. In our different path and our different journey, there are foundational things that, why is that? Because here's what scripture says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same forever. So what do you mean? Next five weeks, just things that don't, they transcend generation, which means a hundred years ago, this was true for Christ followers. In India, this is true for Christ followers. In Australia, this is true for Christ followers. In Ukraine, this is true for Christ followers. And in Winder, this is true for Christ followers. Foundational truths and practices that don't change. Pastor, what are you talking about? Let's go. If you got your apps, you got your notes, first one's this. The Bible is God's word to us and God's word for us. That is foundational. The Bible... Is God's word to us and God's word for us. Why do you say that? I know that, Jason, but let me make sure, make sure we're on the same page. All the words in Scripture are God's word. In human history, the influence of the Bible is unprecedented. In the area, I mean, whether you see it just as a historic piece of inspired literature, it's unprecedented in its influence. In areas of human rights, compassion, mercy, marriage, Family, education, government, science, free enterprise, work ethic, art, music, literature. It is the most unprecedented, the most influential piece of literature. Let's just start there. That's what we think of it. it, The world's ever known. It's, it's, It's almost inarguable, right? For a Christian, it's the foundation of our faith. So when we say the Bible, what do we say? We're talking about the 66 books of the Bible, 39 books in the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, which, by the way, was the scriptures that Jesus in the early church read. So when Jesus says, when he's kind of fending off temptation from Satan in Matthew 4, he goes, man shall not live on bread alone, but he lives on the actual, he finds his food and his nourishment from the actual words that come from God's mouth. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. I know there's a little debate these days on the the relevance of the Old Testament. Jesus actually talked about it. We have the New Testament as well, the 27 books of the New Testament. Well, what divides the Old Testament and the New Testament? The what is not a what, it's a who, and his name is Jesus. Jesus enters in and alters everything. He is the hinge point of history, and he's the focal point of the Bible. Church, the Bible isn't a book that contains the words, uh, some words of God. The Bible is actually God's word to us. The Bible wasn't given to us for our information. The Bible is given to us for our personal transformation. The Bible's not given to us for some historical information about God that will help you in life. The Bible now, living and active, given to us for our personal transformation. So here's what Paul in 2 Timothy tells uh, his, little, his understudy, young Timothy. Here's what he says. All scripture is God-breathed. And we'll come back to that. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here's what he's saying. It is not the Bible, the Word of God is not some stagnant piece of literature that you can use for a reference point. It's living and active. It's actively forming you. I love what Martin Luther, the famed theologian, says. When the Bible speaks... God speaks. For the word of God, Hebrews 4, is living and active. 
is sharper than any double-edged sword, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces through the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and marrow. Why is it getting so graphic? Because that's how the word works. It gets up under things. It gets into the details of your life. It gets up under the things that you don't see and begins to penetrate. It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from its sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom must give account. Now, I love what Peter says when he is talking about the scripture. First Peter, the apostle of Jesus. Here's what he says, and a lot of people missed it. I want you to see this. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy, now he's not talking about future events. He's talking about no words of God. No prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. This is Peter. So big that you get that. He goes, for prophecy or God's word never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here's what he's saying. Me, Paul, Peter, me, Paul, James, John, the apostles, we're not giving you our take on God. The very Spirit of God has inspired us and God is speaking to us. Or it's God is speaking through us to you. That's what he's saying. That's what the word is. Our shared foundation is God's holy word. Everybody look at me. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is a lamp unto your feet and it's a light unto your path. God's word from the front to the back, Oconian 211. Here's the whole deal. You got to get. Here's where our culture and the church is missing it. If God's word's a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path, it is a lamp unto your feet and a light to your path. Here's what that means. God's word isn't leading me in one direction and you in a different direction. It's leading us in the same direction. Now, you got to make sure you're with me because I don't think you're with me. The earlier crowd was half the size and they were with me. I'm going to say it again because this is big. Listen to me. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. It's a lamp unto your feet. It's a light unto your path. I'm going to follow with me here because you got to get this. What that means in our unique, my experience, my personal thoughts, my wiring, God's word's not leading me in one direction and you in another direction. We share God's word. It's leading us in the same direction. Church, are you with me? So here's what that means. When Jesus says, follow me, Jesus isn't going 10,000 different directions. He's going one, and so are you and I. And so are you and I. So let's make sure we're tracking. Jesus actually believed that he was the focus of the entire Bible. Easter, and who can forget Easter? No way you forgot my message two weeks ago. Y'all would never do such a thing. Luke 24, I preached, on East, I preached Easter. The, the young guys leaving the scene of Jerusalem, walking to Emmaus, trying to figure out who Jesus is. Jesus appears to them in his resurrected form, and they were restrained from seeing him, is what Luke 24 says. And they're trying to piece together who Jesus is, and Jesus is walking alongside, listening to them. And in Luke 24, here's what it says. When Jesus, he begins to explain who he is, and he goes, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He's saying all of this points to me. So in John 5, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious elite. Everybody put your nose in the air right quick like this. That's what the Pharisees were. They had their nose high in the air. You're not as holy as they were. They know more than you did. So Jesus is talking to them going, hey man, you know the text pretty well, but you're missing the point of the text. Look at what Jesus says. You study the scriptures. Again, they're talking about the Old Testament here because they, the, the New Testament was being written in Jesus' time based on Jesus' life. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. They are the very scriptures that testify to me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You guys think, here's what Jesus is saying, that the eternal words of life are in the text. I'm telling you, the eternal words of life are the object of the text, and I am the object of the text. So what Jesus is saying, Jason, I hear you, man, but I got to be honest with you. I'm all for God's word. Like, I believe it's God's word, and and, and I, I believe it's about Jesus, but sometimes when I try to read it or get in it, it's hard. It's difficult. 
Like I can take a verse at a time, but when I actually like try to open it up and get into it, I don't see it. I don't get it. It doesn't connect. Many people know the Bible's a book about Jesus, but when they crack it open themselves and they begin to poke around, they're not quite sure how it all fits together. Now, obviously, I'm not talking to you people. Y'all are like, no, man, we know it front. I'm talking about the Oconee campus, okay? They don't know. <laughs> you got out there in Oconee County, don't know. You know what I mean? Talking to the 211 campus. But let's just have a moment. Have you ever thought to yourself, yeah, it's God's word, but when I open it up, it seems to be a bunch of disconnected story and disconnected characters from a different time and a different place and a different culture, and I'm not quite sure what it means or why it says this or why that should matter to me. I know you wouldn't admit that on a Sunday, but many of you, I'm just going to admit it for you. I'm going to admit it for you. So the danger when that happens is we begin thinking, well, you know when, like pastor, like knowing the word and explaining the word are for guys like you, not people like me. And there's a danger when we do that. Let me give you an example right quick. These two things right here are the same thing. iPhones, two views, same thing. You sit there and you go, you know what, man? You give me this phone. This is a little older model here, obviously, right? If you see it on screen, you give me this phone. And I don't know everything about it, but boy, I, I, can, I can get around that thing. I mean, you, you know, I, I don't know like what my kids know, all the ins and outs and how to hide the apps because they think I know the apps on their phone, but they really got them hidden from me. You know, I don't know how to do all that. You didn't know that, parents? A whole new thing, okay? And so <laughs> some of you will go home and go, let me see your phone, right? <laughs> but... I, I, I could get around that. And Jason, like I hear you or I hear a guy like Pastor Matt or, or a pastor that I like to hear. When I hear them, it's like, okay, man, this makes sense. Okay, man, this is speaking to me. I could do something with that. But when I try to read it on my own, it's like all this circuitry and all this kind of how it all fits together and all these little finite pieces. Like I don't know what to do with it if I'm honest with you, Jason. That's honestly how many times people in the church feel. I'm not getting on to you. I'm just kind of speaking. Like, yeah, like on Sunday, it makes sense. Right? Yeah, man, that's speaking to me. That's God's word. But on Tuesday morning at 6 a.m., that's what it feels like. It's like, this, so how does this all work together? And, how to, and so what begins to happen? Here, here's what I'll make sure, church. I get it, but I'll help you a little bit. God's word isn't given to us. God's word is it given to us so that pastors like me can translate it? God's word is given to us because God is speaking to you. Because God's speaking to you. And when we give up on the scripture, we miss what's most important in life, that the creator and Lord actually wants to say something to you right where you are in what you're dealing with, what you're walking through. So let me help you and simplify for a second. Just like your life is telling a story, the Bible's telling a story. Your life's telling an active story right now. And the Bible's not telling a story about the history of God. The Bible's telling a story that we find ourselves in now. The story of God that's playing out now. In fact, scholars, theologians, pastors have kind of helped give a framework over the years to help people understand the Scripture. Right? It's called a worldview. Every major religion, every major life philosophy... Right, has some type of worldview. And a worldview is questions that are the big questions in life and how they're answered. So Islam has a worldview, answers the big questions of life. Mormonism, worldview, answers the big questions of life. Hinduism, Buddhism, in our time, what's championed in our culture is secularism and humanism. They have answers to life's big questions. They have answers to life's big questions. So what do you mean? I put it in your notes. Real simply. Let me, this is what scripture is speaking to. It's really kind of four parts. Answers the big questions of life. Creation. What do you mean? Where did we come from and why are we here? The Bible says we're created by God and for God. We are created to have a relationship with him and relationship with each other. The Bible says that you and I are created in the image and likeness of God. And because of that, every life matters. Right? That's the qu deep questions of life, big questions of life. Where do we come from? Why are we here? It's the question up under the longings in our soul. Now, interestingly enough, the Bible, let me say this because I know you're taking notes this morning. Make sure you're with me right here. Interestingly, the Bible only says there are two things on this planet that are breathed out by God. Did you know that? There are two things that are breathed out by God. 
His word in you. You tell me what has the highest value. The two things breathed out by God in our world, the Bible teaches, is his word. And what did Paul say? All scripture is God breathed. God breathed. So where do we come from? Why are we here? Scripture speaks to that. Here's the second thing. The Bible calls it the fall. The fall is the question of what went wrong? Why is there so much evil in the world? The Bible's clear and definitive answer to that sin, that we've missed the mark. Just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they decided that they knew better than God. So they did the one thing that God said not to do. You and I, yes, sir, I'm talking about you. You at times think you know better than God. I at times think I know better than God. And we go our own way. Scripture says, the back to the front, that you and I aren't born. And this is going to blow some of your young mom's mind in this room. Scripture I says you and I aren't born good and our environment makes us bad. That sweet baby of yours wasn't born good. They were born with a sin nature. It's what the Bible teaches. I don't know if I like that. It doesn't matter if you like it. I'm just, you may not agree with it. But it's what the Bible teaches. We're born with a sin nature. We mean, we're not born good and then the world makes us dead. No, we're born inherently inside of us. We're not just living in a broken world. We're broken people. In the whole Old Testament, you mean summarize the 39 books to get you really confused? The whole Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, is that we could not get to God on our own. We had the law, we couldn't keep it. Prophets come along, kings come along, and then all these different sacrifices and goats and dead sheep laying everywhere. We're like, how does this got to do with anything? Right? Well, we couldn't make it right with God on our own. And so the question then is this. Deep questions of life. What's the solution to our problem? Humanism will tell you. It's science and the evolution of man. Scripture says, no, no, the solution to our problem, enter Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. The chasm, the deep separation between God and us was bridged by Jesus. He became our substitute, took our place. He became our sacrifice. He paid the penalty for our sins. He is our Savior. Listen, sacrifice, substitute, he is our Savior. And here's the best news. When he got up out of that grave, death no longer has the last word, church. That's what we believe. And those who believe in his name are saved, and you have the literal presence of God that lives within you. Now, we still live in a broken world, but you have the presence of God that dwells within you. And really, the other question is simply this, restoration. How's all this going to end? See, I tell people oftentimes, where you and I live, where are we living in the middle of this right now? If you want to know, you can write me right here. Just write your name, not me, you, right? <laughs> write it right here. We live between redemption and restoration. We believe, well, what I like to say, we live between the already and the not yet. We've already been made right with God because of Christ, but we live in a broken world that is not restored yet. The end of the story, what we wait on, and what is now closer than it has ever been, is the return of Jesus Christ. That Jesus promised to come back and destroy all sin, all evil, and all rebellion. What happens when that happens? There is no more sickness. There is no more pain. There is no more evil. God's kingdom will come. This is the story of God's word. This is the Bible. This is the story the Bible is telling. And this is the story you find yourself in right now. Now, leave this up for a second. Thanks. Candidly. When everything is up and to the right, kids are nailing it. Bank account's good. Everything's happening. All is well. These are questions that maybe at night we sometimes think about laying in bed, but we don't ask a whole lot. We just kind of live life and we run and we're busy and we're going. And look at us on Instagram and how it's good and we're nailing it. And look at how great this is and look at how wonderful this is. And we don't stop and think. But let me tell you what I found pastoring for 20-something years now. When life hurts, we begin to ask the hard questions of life. When cancer comes, we begin answering the hard questions of life. When that beautiful baby becomes a prodigal, we begin answering the questions of life. When he leaves you, we begin answering the hard questions of life. When the money in the bank isn't answering the questions. When your kids aren't as great as you thought they were. When you realize that your retirement account and your retirement plans are just that, plans. They're not insurance. And they're not, you're not insured, right? 
we begin to ask these questions. The scripture speaks to the big life questions. This is where we find ourselves. Why do you say all this? And here's where I want to get really practical and press for a second as we come down the home stretch. For followers of Jesus, the Bible is our authority. For followers of Jesus, the Bible is our authority. Famed pastor, dead and gone. Guys like me called him the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon. The guy would stand pastored in England. The guy would stand in front of thousands of people without one of these little fancy, do, without these lights and without these screens. He would stand in front of thousands of people and he would be, it would bellow and echo his voice. Right? I don't know if bellows a word, but it was good. It was loud. Like, what, what, what did I just say there? Or something, though. Something in there. Sometimes I make up words if y'all not figured that out. But I love what he says because what I want you to say, listen, everybody, followers of Jesus, all our campuses, if you're a follower of Jesus, raise your hand around this room. Followers of Jesus. This, look, look, keep them up. What I'm telling you is the Bible is your authority. Put it down. Here's, but here's, you live in a world where the Bible's not your, the Bible's not our authority. This is, the, this is the conundrum we find ourselves in. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. The Bible is not the light of the world. It's the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. That's why Jesus says you're the light of the world. Some of you need to get your phone out and take a picture of that. <laughs> and instead of Charles Spurgeon, say Jason Britt, right? <laughs> it's Charles Spurgeon. It's Charles Spurgeon. Right? I'm not that good at all. Here's what he means. Is what I'll say. In a culture that says you are your own authority, those of us in Christ, believers, acknowledge God is our authority and God has given us his word. In a culture that says, right now, you're your own authority. We as believers believe the Bible is our authority. And God has given us his word, and it's the scripture. In this shifty, uncertain world, God has actually given us his words. Concrete, unmoving, fixed. What does that mean? Your Bible is going to have the same words in them tomorrow that it does today. Church, we read it to be wise, we believe it to be safe, and we practice it to be holy. What does holy mean? Set apart. It contains light to direct you. It contains food to support you and comfort to encourage you. What is under fire in our time more than you realize in your life right now is the Bible is your authority. What happens in the church, again, the Bible is not the world's authority. The Bible is the believer's authority. What happens in the church oftentimes, and what I mean is for Christians, Oh, yeah, yeah, man, the Bible is God's word. The Bible is our authority. But what begins to go, when, when, when we look at something that it says and we go, well, you know, that's, that was kind of that time and that place, ultimately what we're saying is then that's not our authority. Right? We live in an anti-authority time. Like, do you know the last 10 years, let me show you, because we think it's cute and we've all said it. So when the guy who's present is not your present, what do you say? That's not my. That's a dangerous statement we make, and we make it very flippantly. You're living in an anti-authority times. What that means is if I don't agree with this person, I don't have to listen to what they say. That's what we do. Well, I'm telling you right now, you're breathing in this. And we're real flippant about it, but what I see in the church is we're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But when the scripture goes against things that we don't like it going against, we say the Bible's authority, but then we decide what's actually in it matters. Here's what that means. The Bible's not your authority. You are. That's, what, th that's the reality. Again, the Bible's not the world's authority. The Bible says it's not the world's authority. Bible's our authority as believers. 
Well, I, you know, I think some things are really like practical, but there's some things that I think more about that time and place. That's fine that you think that, but you're saying you decide what's God's word and what's real for you and what's not. Just make sure. So here's what that means. God's word's not your authority. You're your authority. So Tim Keller, New York City, pastor for 30 years. In fact, there's a couple here that attended his church a few times. We talk about it at times. The epitome, Tim Keller in his book, The Reason for God, chapter 7 is worth the price of admission alone. It is not easy read. But he says in New York City, he pastored for 30 years, Redeemer Presbyterian Church. New York City, the capital of you're not my God, I'm my own authority, right? He pastored there. And here's what he said. The Bible is our authority is the question the church has to answer in this generation. Not the world, but the church. So this is straight from him. It was so good, I took it straight from him. He says, if you don't trust the Bible enough to let it challenge and correct your thinking, how could you ever have a personal relationship with God? Because this is God's Word. In only truly personal relationships, like we're in a personal relationship, the other person has to be able to contradict you. Right? Here's what I mean. If you're sitting by the person you're married to, I'm guessing y'all have, a, I'm guessing y'all have a personal relationship, right? If not, we can do some counseling and help things out, right? <laughs> Email info at BethlehemChurch.us, and maybe we can hop in there. <laughs> but listen, I'm guessing, person you got your arm around, person you're sitting there, I'm guessing right here, you two have probably not agreed on everything all your life. Yeah, he, they have, but everybody else is not the same, <laughs> right? But it's a personal relationship because there's still a relationship even when they contradict one another. Even when Nan and I, right? Still a relationship. Here's what Keller says. What happens if you eliminate anything from the Bible that offends your sensibility and crosses your will? If you pick and choose what you want to believe and reject the rest, how will you ever have a God who can contradict you? Here's what he said. You won't. Now, I just said a lot. I'm going to say it one more time, and I'm going to walk right through it. And I'm talking not to a lost, broken world. I'm talking to believers. What happens if you eliminate anything from the Bible that offends your sensibility or isn't culturally acceptable anymore and crosses your will? If you pick and choose what you want to believe and reject the rest, how will you ever have a God who can contradict you? You won't. Now, these are my words. You will not have a God who contradicts you. You will have a God of your own making. And a God of your own making, let me paraphrase, is a figment of your imagination. You've made up a God that serves you. Let me go back to it, which means you're your own God. You're your authority. Now, as pastor, people, I had this conversation, and the room's locked in, so we can tell this is like the, con the conversation in our time. I had this conversation, well, yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus, but there's just some things I struggle with that are like principle truths. So yes to Jesus, but I don't like what he says about, I don't like what the Bible teaches about money. Yes to Jesus, but I don't like what the Bible teaches about marriage. Yes to Jesus, but I don't really like what the Bible teaches about this or that, sexuality or raising your kids or uh, obeying authority. Yes to Jesus, but I don't like these things, whatever, Right? 95% of the time when people do the yes to Jesus, but, because the issue is not yes to Jesus, I don't like the church. Let me, let me tell you what that means. Yes to Jesus, I just don't like everything the Bible teaches. So we have a culture, and in the church right now is yes to Jesus, my Savior, but I don't like everything the Bible teaches. 95% of the time. When that happens, there is a stronghold in a person's life or there is some personal rebellion taking place in their life and they are served by taking the things that are crystal clear in Scripture and acting like they're suddenly fuzzy or ambiguous. They have some, when, when people do, oh yeah to Jesus, but let me tell you why they do it. And some of us, this is us right now. And I love you, I'm your pastor, I'm with you. This has been me at times. Oh, yes to Jesus, but when Scripture presses up on something in my life, right, the reason we press back is because 95% of the time there's a stronghold in your life, there's an area of personal rebellion where it serves you well to take things that are crystal clear in Scripture and suddenly make it ambiguous and fuzzy. Like, oh, I, didn't, I don't really know. I think that was more about that time and that place. And I mean, uh, listen, you then, my, my, my friend, my sister, 
my brother, you, in essence, are your own God. You're your own God. For followers of Jesus, here's what I'm saying. The Bible is like inhaling. That's how, cent- that's how foundational it is. We need the Bible not only because it corrects us, we need the Bible because it oxygenates us. Now, post-COVID, backside of COVID world, let's all do something real quick. Everybody take, and don't spit out when you do this, but everybody take a big inhale at once. You heard it all over the room. You can breathe now, okay? Listen to me, listen to me. If you can't do that, here's what that means. You're dead. That's just the truth for all of us. You got to suck oxygen to be alive. In a broken world, we do not need the word to correct our thinking only. In a broken word, in a broken world, we need the word because our souls are empty. Our souls are empty. Bible, you've got to make Bible reading, you've got to build it into your life just like eating breakfast. What do you mean? You eat breakfast long enough, it becomes a habit. Some of you at 6.30, if you don't have that Pop-Tart, you don't know what to do. <laughs> Give me that Pop-Tart. Frosted strawberry in the house, right? Give me that Pop-Tart. It's become such, I don't eat that. I eat a banana. Well, you're a loser. The rest of us eat Pop-Tarts. <laughs> I don't, uh, Pastor, I wish you wouldn't make jokes like that. Well, fine, go somewhere else. Now listen, <laughs> right? I'm joking, I'm joking. My wife will get on to me. We love you. I need to eat healthier. I'm with you, okay? <laughs> no. But listen, listen, we, there's not a lot we are as humans, but what we are is a bunch of habit-forming creatures. We're, that's what we do. God's love and favor doesn't take a hit when we don't read the Word, but when we don't read the Word, can I tell you what happens? We become malnourished, and when we become malnourished, we become unhealthy. God's love and favor doesn't take a hit on you when you don't read the Word. God loves you in Christ Jesus. His favor is for you. You aren't growing and like, oh, now you're, no, 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 no. But what happens is you become malnourished. And when you're malnourished, here's what that means. You're unhealthy. You're unhealthy. So let me give you two challenges as we wrap up. If you're new to the faith, coming back to the faith, trying to rekindle, right? Go back to the little circuitry board here. If you're like, hey, man, I've tried, but this is what it feels like sometimes. Like, hey, Sundays, I'm like, yeah. Mondays, I'm like, man, right? Here's what I tell you. Start two places. The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. One chapter a day. Here's the other one I tell people. Jesus' brother, James. James, five chapters. The most practical, straightforward. Just start there. One chapter a day. This week on social media, our staff is putting out all the different resources we use personally in our lives. The Dwell app. Right? It's an unbelievable app. Best thing you could do. We get no, it's free. The Dwell app on your phone. Unbelievable. Use it all the time. Use it this morning before I got up and read. Just walking you through scripture. Right? If you are a person who's in the word, and there are many people in this room who are followers of Jesus, and we are in the word, can I give you a challenge? It doesn't mean we make it every day, but we try to make it a practice in our life. Everybody from the front right here. Reading somebody else's words about God is not the same as reading God's word. And we live in a place that there's a whole industry built with pastors and women authors and theologians and and Christian celebrities and whatnot that write. And many of them are very helpful. Many of them are good. I'm a reader. I read them too. But what I'm telling you is reading what somebody else says about God is not the same thing as reading what God has for you. What God has for you. We have to stay hooked up to the IV of the gospel. You got to stay hooked up to the IV of the gospel in a broken world. Draw life and strength from God's holy word. So let me end with this story. You guys got me going, so I got to wrap it up fast here. Y'all got me rolling. I got another service coming. If this is 1115, they'd be in trouble. I'd still be rolling. <laughs> they'd be in trouble. You're like, that's why we come to 930, big boy, because you got to get done. <laughs> Anybody ever heard the name Billy Graham? <laughs> Raise your hand, Billy Graham. Okay. Probably most famed pastor of our time, passed away a few years ago. Billy Graham, advisor to many presidents. What I love about Billy Graham is he died in his late 90s, and in this day and time, he died with his character intact, which is a hard thing to do. Most people know Billy Graham, but many people don't know the name Chuck Templeton. Billy and Chuck 
were good friends and rising young, young influencers in the church in evangelical circles at the same time. Most people considered Chuck Templeton a better communicator, more gifted than Billy. They were coming up at the same time. This is in Billy's own words. Early in Billy's life, he talked about how he wrestled whether he was going to accept God's word as God's word. Not just is it a word from God or a word, it's like the inspired, infallible, inerrant, this is God's word to us. He said that was the wrestling of his generation, what they were going to do with the word. His friend Chuck wrestled with it as well. Chuck decided that for him, this just couldn't be the word of God. Yeah, it had things about God. Yeah, there were things that were true of it. But the idea of a, an inspired word of God to us was too much for him to wrestle with. And so Chuck rejected it. In fact, he tried to lead Billy down the same road, having these long conversations and long conversations about, well, here's the problem with this, and here's the problem with this, here's the problem with this. And Billy said he wrestled with it. Until one day, finally, walking through a forest in California, just spending time with God. He said he got on his knees, and here's the prayer he prayed with a Bible in his hand at a rock. He said, God, I cannot prove certain things. I cannot answer some of the questions Chuck is raising and some of the other people are raising, but I'm choosing to accept this book by faith that it's the Word of God. Billy preached in front of hundreds of millions of people and hundreds of thousands of people will be in heaven because of Billy Graham. And he said the most important decision in his life was what his foundation was. Nobody remembers the name Chuck Templeton. After Chuck decided that the word wasn't central in his life, Chuck left the ministry and rejected the faith altogether. This is in a different article. Billy didn't say this. He was interviewed at the age of 83, Chuck Templeton. He was now living with Alzheimer's disease. And he was asked by a journalist about that early decision that God's word's not God's word. He said he reflected back on his life. And when he was asked that, the only thing he could say with tears in his eyes was he missed Jesus. And then he broke down in tears and could say no more. To say you walk with Jesus, to say Jesus is your savior and this isn't the word is impossible. If you miss the word, you miss Jesus. Will you stand with me across our campuses this morning? Father, I pray. Will you just put your hand over your heart for a second? I'll pray for you, my friend. God, I pray you give us a love for your word once again. In a shifty, uncertain time, God, that we'd have a love for your word. For those that, that have walked away from it, that think they know it because they know a story about David and Goliath, or they know the Easter story, they know the Christmas story, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would remind them you have something to say to them. God has something for you. God's word is God's word to us, and it is for us. So we're going to have a practice. You can look up at the screen with me as we close. And the practice is just this. We're going to make this our declaration. I just want us as a church, May the 1st, 2022, where you're your own authority, where you map out your own direction, where you live your life and I live my life, I want us to say together to each other, this is true. I don't want you to say if it's not true for you. But Psalm 119 simply says this, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Do you believe that, church? So let's say it together from the front to the back on the count of three. One, two, three. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want us to say this for our kids. Will you say it with me on the count of three? One, two, three. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want us to say this for the decisions we're trying to make right now in life. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want us to say this for the pain that we're dealing with in our life right now. We're trying to find answers. Will you say this with me? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Church, do you believe that? That is our word. We have to stay hooked up to the IV. One more time, and then we're going to do the declaration, the song we've been teaching you. Because the center of the word, the object of the word is Christ. And so when we are in the word, we are walking with Jesus. On the count of three, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Joel, sing this with us. 
Christ is my firm foundation. Oh, the rock on which I stand. There is no condemnation. Don't beat yourself up. Just reawaken yourself to the scripture. I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. His word's a lamp. Because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. Transcends time and space. So I would he fell down. He won't. One more time, Joel. Take us through it. Sing this church. Christ is my firm foundation. And it's that name that we find in the word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You are our firm foundation. We believe these things and claim these things in the church. And it's in his name we pray. And everybody said? So before you leave, our prayer teams are going to make their way. If we can pray for you, we can pray God's word over you, we would love to this morning. I'll be in the living room if I haven't met you. God's words, a lamp to your feet, a light to your path. Chap John chapter 1, James 1, we'll have stuff on the uh, website. Man, will you pray for you? Come on down. Joel, continue sing. You guys be blessed, and we'll see you next Sunday. So to our online family, thank you so much for worshiping with us. As Pastor Jason said, there's some great resources online, especially our foundation uh, book. It is a 21-day journey that will help you in your spiritual walk. Uh, there's a digital copy online, so whether you go to our website at BethlehemChurch.us or whether you have the Bethlehem Church app, you can access it from there. And listen, if you have prayer requests, we would be honored to pray with you. Uh, you can go to prayer.bethlehemchurch.us and there's a place on there for you to write your prayers out and then we commit as a staff and as volunteers to pray for you. If you need anything, please reach out to us, but we hope you have a fantastic week. We love you, and we'll see you next Sunday.